Yo, what's up guys and welcome back to a new video. Today we're sticking with the Halloween vibes and take a ride through the haunted house called Waycrest Manor. So without further ado, let's get our costumes out of the closet and get straight into it. We start off by fighting some soul essences. These mobs are pretty harmless and they only have one ability called Scar Soul which we will want to interrupt. If this goes through, however, it isn't the end of the world and you will take mediocre damage for it. Moving on, we'll face some new mobs. First off, we get the Bewitched Captain. Once again, a pretty harmless mob, but we do need to watch out for the frontal called Shadow Cleave. Besides Shadow Cleave, the Captain will cast Spirited Defense. This will reduce their damage taken by 35%, so make sure to kick this. Other than the Captain, we'll face the Fizzle Acolyte. Paired with some Blight Toads and the Acolyte will cast Infected Torn. This will do minor damage to the target and leaving a dot on them. This doesn't do a whole lot of damage, but it counts as a disease in case you want to dispel it. Besides Infected Torn, they will periodically cast Drain Essence, which you would also want to kick, preventing some shadow damage to the target over time. Lastly, we'll see some Blighted Toads. They will explode after a few seconds of dying, indicated by a green swirly, and you will simply need to move out of them. After we dealt with this trash, we will fight the first boss. This will be a council type boss and we'll have to deal with Sister Briar, Sister Solena and Sister Melody. Instead of being able to hit all of them at once, they will rotate an iris in between of them. The sister with the iris will take full damage, while the other sisters will have both their damage done reduced and their damage taken reduced. All sisters have unique abilities when they hold the iris, so let's dive into them one by one starting off with Sister Solena. While holding the iris, Sister Solena will use Aura of Evity. This will reduce the healing done by all players for 50% while under this effect. Other than Aura of Apathy, Sister Solena will spam cast Soul Bolt. This will deal mediocre damage when going through, so you want to interrupt as many as possible since everyone already has their healing done reduced. Lastly, Sister Solena will be able to cast Soul Manipulation while holding the Iris. This will mind control a player till they reach 50% HP. So you will need to quickly CC and damage the player to stop this effect. While a player is mind controlled, the boss will also gain soul armor, which will reduce their damage taken by 99%. So make sure to get the player out of the mind control as first priority. Next up the list we have Sister Melody. While holding the iris, Sister Melody will use Aura of Dread, which will stack a dot on the players, which will be removed by just simply moving around. Other than Aura of Dread, Sister Selena will spam cast Runus Bolt, which will once again do mediocre damage and you want to kick it as often as possible. Besides Runus Bolt, Sister Melody will also gain access to Unstable Runic Mark while holding the Iris, marking all the players with a big purple circle. This will deal ticking damage over time for 6 seconds and then they will explode. The curse however can be dispelled, but you will still explode after 6 seconds. So make sure to be spread out and have a defensive ready for when this happens. And lastly we have Sister Briar. While holding the Iris, Sister Briar will use Aura of Forms. This Aura will make you take damage back while doing damage to Sister Briar. So make sure to not accidentally kill yourself with this. Other than the Aura of Forms, Sister Briar will also spam cast Bramble Bolt, which you would once again want to interrupt as much as possible, and especially because of the Aura of Forms, this can lead to accidental deaths, so make sure to keep an eye out for it. When Sister Briar holds the Iris, she will gain access to Jacked Nettles. This ability will put a bleed on a random player dealing mediocre damage till the player is healed above 90% HP. Healers keep an eye out for this as you want to get the player up above 90% ASAP since they are also taking damage from Aura of Forms. Now that we've dealt with the Spooky Sisters, we can make our way to the second boss. But before we get there, we will face a few new mobs and also some mobs that we've already seen before. First up, we will meet a Heart's Bane Runeweaver. This mob will cast Edge decently frequently, dealing a massive amount of damage over time while channeling onto a player. You cannot stop this effect, so healers make sure that the targeted player will get some extra love. Secondly, we will face a Runic Disciple. This mob will cast Runic Bolt for mediocre damage, which you will want to simply interrupt. Secondly, they will cause Spellbind, which you would also want to interrupt to stop some extra damage. After we're dealing with these mobs, it's time to set foot in the courtyard. When we first set foot in the courtyard, we will face a few new mobs. First of all, we see a Coven Thornshaper. 
This mob will cast Infected Thorns, dealing minor damage to the target and leaving a dot over time. Besides Infected Thorns, we will also see them cast Uproot. This will spawn a patch of roots under the player, dealing minor damage, slowing them, and also knocking them up if they don't move out of it in time. The second mob we find is the Jacked Hound, and we'll find plenty of them in the courtyard. Besides having a scary name, they won't really do that much. They will only deal minor tank damage and they can easily be combined with other pools in this area. Before fighting the boss we will find one last pack with the demi boss Matron Brindle in it. Brindle will cast Torn Barrage, doing a lot of tank damage over a period of 6 seconds, so make sure that you have some active mitigation for this. Secondly, Brindle will also cast Splinter Spike. This will spawn a brown swirly under all the players which will erupt a splinter dealing a lot of damage and also knocking them back if you do not move out of it in time. Alright, now it's time for the second boss which is Soulbound Goliath. And there's quite some mechanics that we're gonna cover about this boss. First of all you'll notice a buff stacking on the boss the moment you enter combat. Every 2 seconds the boss will gain a stack of soul harvest, increasing the boss's damage done by 5%. To remove this effect you will need to drag the boss through a patch of fire left on the ground. When you walk the boss through the fire, all stacks will be removed, but the entire group will take a lot of damage while the stacks are being removed. So make sure to not do this too often, because it will prevent people from bleeding out too soon. When you clear the boss of stacks, every player will get a burned soul following them around for 10 seconds. You will need to kite these around to prevent a lot of extra unnecessary damage. The boss will also cast soul forms. Periodically stunning one player in a route while doing a lot of damage to them for the duration that they're being trapped. To free them you will need to kill the fine stunning the player and once the roots have been killed the player stops from taking damage and is no longer stunned. If you play human however you can use your racial to get out of this effect instantly. And last on the list the boss will do a tank buster called crush. This can be very scary for tanks especially when the boss is on a high amount of stacks of soul harvest. So make sure that you have some active mitigation ready when this comes out. With the second boss out of the way we can make our way to the third boss. When we first enter the hallway we will see a lot of mobs and most of them are mostly harmless. The devouring maggots will do a little moderate damage to random players with spit, leaving a 10 second minor dot on the player and furthermore they don't really do too much. The gore stained piglets will cast snout smack for minor damage and it can also mostly be ignored. And lastly we have the infected peasants. This will do also do mediocre to minor damage to random players with withering glob. Do be aware though that this pool can ramp up in difficulty pretty fast. The more you pull the more random damage goes out to players and the harder it gets to heal. With most of the harmless mobs out of the way let's take a look at the slightly more difficult mobs coming up. Firstly we will meet the faceless maidens. They will cast horrific visage. This is a priority kick, since it will fear the entire party if it isn't stopped. Secondly, we have the Banquet Stewards. They will cost Dinner Bell. This ability will channel for 2.5 seconds and it will be seen by a big yellow circle around them. If you are not out of this within the time, you will take significant damage and you also get silenced for 2 seconds. The last mob that we find here are the Waycrest Revelers. These are also pretty harmless and they only do some minor tank damage. It's time for boss number 3 on the list, which is Raul the Glutamus. This boss is revolved a lot around dodging avoidable damage, so get your running shoes on and let's get straight into it. To start the boss off we will see him aim towards a location with Rotten Expulsion. This will spawn 4 little adds which are pretty harmless. If you stand in the direction the boss is facing in while it's casting the ability, you will take quite a chunk of damage though, so make sure to move out in time. When the little ads are killed, they will explode, indicated by a green swirly. Also make sure to move out of those, because they will explode for quite some damage and they will leave a toxic patch behind on the ground. The next ability on the list is Tenderize. The boss will cast a big frontal cone towards the position the tank was standing in while the cast started. You will need to move out of this to prevent taking a massive chunk of damage and most likely dying if you get hit. This ability will repeat itself two more times and it will always aim towards the current position of the tank when the start of the cast happened. Lastly the boss will cast Call Servant. This will summon multiple adds from every door in the room which will slowly start walking towards the boss. You will need to kill these before they reach the boss to prevent the boss from gaining 5% increased damage per servant eaten. 
this effect will remain for the entirety of the fight. The Serpents can be CC'd however, so make sure to use your stuns and grips wisely. After dealing with the third boss, we will find some mobs that we've already fought before and also some new ones. We want to skip most of the trash in the basement, however, since it's very inefficient compared to other areas in the dungeon to obtain count. If you, however, choose to play it, we will face Matron Alma. She will cast Dreadmark, which will mark a player for 6 seconds, dealing ticking damage and also exploding after expiring. Secondly, she will cast Ruinous Folly. You will always want to prio kick this, since it will do a big hit to the entire party. Last on the list, she will cast Decaying Touch on the tank, which will increase the damage the tank takes by 15% for 8 seconds. So make sure that you have some active mitigation ready for when this comes out. The last new mob that will face before the fourth boss is the Heartsbane Soul Charmer. This mob will cast two abilities which you will want to kick as much as possible. First on the list they will cast Soul Folly. This will de deal damage to the entire party and it will be a prio kick. Secondly they will cast Soul Bolt. This will do mediocre damage to the targeted player and you would want to kick it whenever you have a leftover kick. There's one more uninterruptible ability you would want to play around. And this is Warding Candles. The Soul Charmer will channel for 2 seconds, placing candles around them and this will reduce the damage they take by 50% while standing next to them. So make sure to kite them out as soon as possible when this comes out. Now that we've fought all of the trash, it's time for Lord and Lady Waycrest. We'll start off fighting Lord Waycrest not once, not twice, but 4 times in total. Every time we kill Lord Waycrest, Lady Waycrest will lose 30% HP and in exchange Lord Waycrest will be healed to full. This will happen 3 times, leaving Lady Waycrest at 10% at which she will join the fight and it will become a 2 boss encounter. So let's start off with the abilities from Lord Waycrest. Firstly he will smack the tank with Wasting Strikes. This will deal a burst of damage and leave a dot on the tank for 5 seconds. This will happen after a 1.5 second cast timer to prepare yourself with some active mitigation before the hits comes out. Secondly, the boss will cast Virulent Pathogen. It will mark one player in the room with a big green circle and the targeted player will have 50% reduced movement speed and he will expire after 5 seconds. When the debuff expires, it will fire a green scroll at the location the player expired in. If someone is in your circle while expiring, they will also receive the same debuff. So make sure to get away from your party when you get targeted by this ability. In the meanwhile, Lady Waycrest will periodically spawn multiple swirlings around the room which you will need to dodge. This is pretty simple, but it will be kinda annoying to deal with when you're also being targeted with the pathogen from before. When Lady Waycrest reaches 10%, she will join the fight. And not much will change in the fight other than you just having two targets to hit instead of one. Before we get to the last boss, we'll find a group of Gloom Horrors. They will periodically jump on the furthest target, dealing a small amount of damage and leaving a minor dot. Other than that, they do minor tank damage and they are not really too much to worry about. So now that we've dealt with the Gloom Horrors, it's time for the fifth and final boss of this dungeon, being Gorak Tool. This boss is relatively easy, so let's dive straight into it with the first ability. The first ability on the list is Summon Dead Touched Slayer. This will spawn an ad that will spam cast Deathlands. You can cleave this ad down while using stops to make sure the Deathlands doesn't go off. If the Deathlands however goes off, the targeted player will be stunned and take a significant hit. So make sure that you always have a stop available to deal with this. The second ability the boss uses is Darkened Lightning. This is an easily interruptible cast and it shouldn't really form too much of a problem since it's on a pretty long timer. Lastly, the boss will use Dread Essence upon reaching 100% energy. This will deal group-wide damage and more importantly it will resurrect all the previously killed adds. So make sure you have AoE CCs available for when this happens to prevent multiple death lenses from going off. However, throughout the encounter alchemical fire files will spawn. These files will let you burn the corpse of a death touched slayer to prevent them from being resurrected again. So make sure to pick these up and use them on the death touched slayers when they die. And that is pretty much everything there is to cover about Waycrest Manor. I think this will probably be one of the easier dungeons in the season with a decently lenient timer I'd say. But I do think that the second boss might cause some issues with tanks being overconfident in the amount of stacks that they can handle. So. It will be interesting to see how they will combat that. 
Anyways, thank you for watching. Make sure to give a thumbs up if you liked the video and consider subscribing. And if you have any questions, feel free to leave a comment down below or ask them when I'm streaming live on twitch.tv slash TV.